Thanks. So everybody knows security is often described as this triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But most security services are thinking primarily about confidentiality and integrity. For example, I have this USB stick, which is encrypted. If I, which is great, nobody can get access to my data. But it also has this feature that if I type the wrong password 10 times, it bricks itself. So imagine a malicious person just bricks my device and I, I'm not even aware. Uh, and this is built into many other security devices as well, such as uh, security safes. So is availability unimportant? Well, it turns out at, at Google we think availability is pretty important for several reasons. Uh, one is if we're down, it's easy for users to move to one of our competitors. Some of our products have SLAs. And of course, we, make, we made $26 billion last quarter, most of which was because our services were up. So how do we ensure that our services stay up? Well, we employ around 1,000 site reliability engineers. So these are people that focus very much on ensuring availability, looking at the redundancy of the services, uh, and, you know, and, they're, and they're thinking about backhoes or you know, whatever could possibly go wrong. Right? Uh, we generally think of availability in terms of percentage of uptime. So if you're 99% up, that's you know, reasonably good, it sounds good, until you consider that's about three and a half days a year of downtime, which is absolutely ridiculous. Nobody would want to use a service like that. Uh, but we'd consider that to be two nines. If you go to five nines, so 99.999% uptime, that gives you only five minutes a year of downtime. So that's pretty extreme, and obviously like, we don't have scheduled downtime, right? You've, you've never seen like, a page on Google saying, sorry, we're down for scheduled maintenance. So, Fine, redundancy deals with most of this, but what if there's an active adversary? So the simplest type of attack, the simplest type of way somebody could try to take us down is through just flooding junk at us, right? So I think about this in terms of, this is a network-based denial of service attack or DOS attack. Obviously, somebody flooding junk from a single machine probably isn't gonna have much impact, so they're gonna need to use multiple machines. So we'd call that a distributed DOS attack or DDoS attack. So how do we think about this from a security perspective? This is basically just standard threat modeling. You think about what are the weaknesses in your defenses and what are an attacker's capabilities and you, and you try to make sure that you can deal with anything that they could throw your way. So let's start with our defense concerns. First of all, everybody has an uplink to the internet. It doesn't matter if you're a home user with 100 megabit or you're a large company with a couple of 10 gig links. If somebody can saturate your uplink to the internet, then you're gonna have an outage. A typical you know, machine can handle around a gigabit, so I, te I tend to measure these attacks in gigabits per second. Another type of attack would be uh, packet processing. Every, every bit of information past crossing the internet is chunked into packets. These packets have to be inspected by intermediate devices, like firewalls, trying to decide if they should forward it on uh, based on your security policy. So what if somebody just floods you with a lot of small packets? Uh, we measure this typically in millions of packets per second because that's about what would kill an individual machine. A third type of attack might be maybe they're sending properly formatted HTTP requests. Um, this can overwhelm your web server. Typical web server can maybe handle 1,000 queries per second, so I'll measure this in uh, KQPS. And, and just an amusing side note, we really did see a user agent of IAM botnet before. This, this isn't made up. Uh, a final thing to consider is many people de design their defenses by identifying bad IPs and blocking them. Well, if you have a linear list of IPs that you're blocking, what if there are too many IPs and you, know, you get some slowdown as you're checking whether the IP is on the list? So we'll consider the size of the botnet in terms of thousands of IPs. Okay, so now let's think about what are attackers doing? You know, obviously they need to get as many machines as they can to, to generate the largest attack possible. So I'll go through some examples uh, that were sort of newsworthy over the past several years. In, in 2009, on the anniversary of the Russo-Georgia War, a botnet was used to target all of the social media accounts of a uh, Georgian activist. Uh, these attacks took down Twitter and LiveJournal and even made Facebook slow. Uh, what wasn't reported in the news was Google's blogger was also attacked, so we had some visibility into this. The next day, they focused the attack on us, and we were able to see it came from about 45,000 uh, home, compromised home user machines and generated an attack of about 600,000 queries per second. So you know, consider 1,000 1, queries per second is about what a normal machine could handle. Um, let's go to an, another example. Uh, a few years later, somebody uh, 
compromise, somebody realized, hey, home machines aren't that powerful. What if we could compromise servers? So they used servers to attack uh, US banks. And they took down many different banks. Uh, they also targeted us. Uh, this wasn't reported because we didn't have an outage. But we measured the attack at 125 gigabits. So again, this is a pretty large attack. Uh, in 2013, somebody realized they don't actually need to compromise machines. All they have to do is get them to send bandwidth. So there's a style of attack called DNS amplification, where you find a, a DNS server, an authoritative DNS server, that has DNSSEC enabled. DNSSEC responses are pretty large. So you can send a small query, and they will send a large response back to you. If you spoof your query to appear to be coming from the victim, then that large response goes back to the victim. And so they were able to use this method to generate up to 300 gigabits. So what's another way you can take advantage of other people's computers? Well, what if you could run JavaScript on them? How do you run JavaScript on these computers? Well, you might man in the middle a website and get it to display, you know, put other content on there. So in 2015, uh, the, apparently the uh, China's Great Firewall was used in this method to man in the middle every connection going to a website in China. And then everybody outside of China who's trying to go to a website in China is joined into part of this botnet that's DOSing GitHub. And so th using this method, around 400,000 IPs could be brought into this botnet. Uh, and now to present day, people are finding there are other ways to get large numbers of machines. It turns out there's a bunch of IoT stuff out there. And it all has default root passwords and really poor security. So you can just log in as root uh, with a default password to over 100,000 devices. So we wanted to get some better visibility into these, this uh, new botnet out, which was called Mirai. Um, and we're trying to think of how can we get better data? And why do we want better data? Well, I've been tracking DOS attacks over about 10 years. And it turns out that attacks are growing exponentially. So this is on a log plot. And it's great to have the data. You know, I can kind of predict the size of future attacks. But the error bar, since this is a log plot, that error bar is in the exponent. So I can't predict it very accurately. So I want to get as much data as I can about attacks. Um, there's also this problem that maybe there's a new attack style out there that we're not familiar with. And we want to get visibility into that. So how do we get this better data? So one thing we did is we launched a, a something called Project Shield under, under Jigsaw, which is a free uh, DOS mitigation for news and election monitoring sites. And so by doing this, we're able to see attacks on these other sites. And it's also good for the world. Um, so we do this by running a reverse proxy. So we, we put our own uh, web server in front of their server, in front of their origin. We protect our reverse proxies through the Google Cloud infrastructure. And then that's also protected by Google's infrastructure. So the entire network setup is fairly complicated, but basically we have layers of protection with each layer protecting the, the part behind it. So as an example, a UDP flooding attack could be blocked by the Google network. A SYN flooding attack would be blocked by the Google cloud load balancer. Um, and then you know, more fancy application layer attacks would be blocked by the Project Shield servers. And so in this way, we can protect the origin server without wasting any resources on our side. OK, so today, hundreds of sites are protected uh, behind Shield. Um, but I want to focus on a specific example today. So many of you may have heard of uh, Brian Krebs. He, he's an investigative journalist who focuses on security issues. Uh, and he's written many amazing articles on undercoming, un uncovering problems in the uh, security community, such as credit card skimmers and, and everything. Um, because he's uncovering all of these scams, he has a lot of enemies in the online world, right? So, and, and they'll take extreme measures to get to him. So one thing they've done is they've swatted him. So for those who aren't aware, swatting is where you make a prank call to the police and you say, hey, there's a hostage situation at my house. And then a SWAT team shows up to your house and they storm in with their guns drawn and it's kind of a dangerous situation for everyone. Uh, he also gets regular DOS attacks to his website, which is sort of, more, more common. I believe he's also had like pizza delivered and drugs delivered, so uh, he has a, a very interesting life. So back in uh, September of last year, Krebs was sort of following the, the DDoS attack stories uh, fairly closely, and he wrote several articles about DDoS attacks. 
uh, people were getting arrested, he was talking about their botnets or you know, ways that they were running booter services. And apparently he built up some enemies. And so he started getting very large DOS attacks. On September 20th, he got a 620 gigabit DOS attack. So to put this in perspective, the largest attack I'd ever measured at that point was 500 gig. So he's getting sort of the largest attack the world has ever seen. Uh, a day later, a, a French hosting provider called OVH claims to have seen a one terabit DOS attack from the same botnet. So you know, these things are going up very quickly and everyone's nervous. Uh, and then on September 22nd, uh, he got yet another attack and his uh, DDoS mitigation provider kicked him off. They basically said, they were, uh, it turns out he was on uh, Prolexic, who was giving him free support um, because they wanted to support the journalist. But they realized this was starting to impact their real customers and it, it wasn't cost effective for them to keep him. And so they kicked him off and gave him two hours to find a new provider, which isn't a lot of time. Uh, so he goes to all the DOS mitigation providers and he says, hey, who can help me? Well, it turns out uh, everybody's afraid, right? Because we don't actually know how big these attacks can get. Um, so, and you know, most said they wouldn't do it. One said maybe they could do it, but it would cost $200,000 a year, which is a lot of money for an independent journalist. So he, he came to us and he said, hey, can, can I join you guys and get on Project Shield? Well, we, we look at this and we're saying, okay, Yes, he qualifies as a news site. How scared are we? You know, what, what happens if this botnet actually takes down Google.com and we lose all of our revenue, right? Um, but you know, we, we considered, well, if the botnet could take us down, we are probably already at risk anyway, right? There's nothing stopping it from attacking us at any time. So we had really had nothing to lose here. So it took us about an hour to discuss and we agreed to take on his site. Um, okay. so, and I have permission from Krebs to share what we've seen with you today. So first of all, migrating the site was very challenging. It turns out that uh, we, our domain verif we, in order to migrate a site, you have to prove that you own that site. Well, he couldn't prove he owned the site because the site was down. We, our fallback method is, well, prove that you control DNS for the site. Well, that was also controlled by Prolexic and was also down. So we said, okay, how about we just move your DNS over to Google Cloud DNS? Well, he had his domain locked because he has to worry about people trying to hijack him all the time. So we go to his provider and say, can you unlock it? And they're like, oh, it's a weekend. We don't know how to do that on the weekend. So like, there are all sorts of like, human problems that you have to face here. Uh, we got that resolved through personal contacts at, at the provider and got him migrated over. And so then we were able to get things going. So we're like, okay, bring it on. Uh, we're ready to see some interesting attacks. I'm, I'm excited. I think this happened like, really close to my birthday. Um, so, Brian tweeted out that a site was coming back up, and 14 minutes later, we saw the first attack. It was about 130 million packet per second SIN flood. So this is pretty large. Uh, it's combined with some resets. And so we learn a couple of things from this. First thing we learn is the attackers are following Brian on Twitter, right? Uh, but, you know, there's no impact to us. So we're like, okay, not a big deal. A minute later, the attack shifts from a SIN flood to an HTTP flood, which was fairly large, and, and this we're, we're definitively sure is from Mirai. So another interesting thing we learned here is that the attackers, when, when something doesn't work, they will very quickly shift to try something else, right? They're gonna just keep trying different random things until they find something that works. Uh, we also unfortunately learned something else here, which was that we had expected the cloud load balancer to rate limit how much traffic it sent to the Shield front ends and that we'd forgotten to configure. So we got a lot of traffic, that was kind of painful, uh, we corrected that oversight. So that, that was our first uh, real learning experience. Okay, an hour later we saw several other uh, layer three attacks. These are all sort of not a big deal for us, they got filtered out. And then things stopped for the night. The next morning Brian put out a blog post called The Democratization of Censorship, saying, you know, hey, it's awfully easy for somebody to censor content on the internet. Four hours later, we saw another attack from Mirai. This one was the largest we'd seen, um, 450,000 queries per second. Uh, so that, that's the first day, right? The first 24 hours of having this site up. Of course, the attacks don't stop. So we continued to see attacks ongoing, uh, fairly heavy for the first week or two, and then things have trailed off, and I think now everyone's basically given up. Uh, but each attack is a great opportunity for us to learn and improve our defenses. 
So let me sort of go over some of the overall lessons that we learned from this. Uh, one thing is defending a small site is really hard. You know, all of, all of my experience at Google for years was defending a very large site, right? If we had an extra thousand queries going through to one of our services, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, but Brian's origin server could maybe handle around 20 queries per second. And as I'd mentioned, we saw attacks of up to 450,000 queries per second. So how do you deal with that, right? It's, it's a little bit challenging. So one thing you can do is you can rate limit the bad traffic. So you have to identify the bad traffic and try to throttle that down. Um, another thing, though, that helps a lot is you can serve good traffic from cache. So this takes a lot of load off of the origin server. It also gives you this benefit of even if the origin server is unhealthy, you still have its content cached. So you can continue to serve users and there isn't really a visible outage. Another thing is, you know, at Google, as I said earlier, we worry a lot about we want our services to be up for all but maybe five minutes a year. Uh, and, but Brian doesn't really have that concern, right? He, he's not as concerned about availability. And so there are sort of other issues that come in play here. You know, he, he's running off of a single machine. Well, his single machine is hosted in some data center somewhere else, right? That data center had a power outage at one point. Like, their whole city had a power outage. So the data center loses power. Well, no problem, data centers have backup power. Turns out, in this particular case, the backup power failed. So his origin server was down for an hour and a half. So it's an important thing to realize, like, yeah, we're security people, we think about the attacks as big, being the biggest threat, but that might not be the biggest threat. Sometimes it's the boring stuff that, that bites you. A third thing was uh, shared debugging is really hard. So you know, we have our infrastructure, there, then there's the origin server, and nobody has complete visibility into all of this. So there was a point after we'd been running for three months and it, things have sort of settled down where users start reporting errors. We check our servers, everything is healthy, other sites are fine. He checks his origin server, everything is fine. And so we go back and forth for a while trying to figure out what could the problem be. Well, it turns out that as our service grows, we added a few more VMs to the mix. He'd configured a firewall that said only traffic coming from our VMs would be permitted to get requests through to his web servers. So when we added new VMs, they weren't permitted by that firewall. So integration points are very tricky, when you're, especially when you're working across organizations. Uh, but you know, finally, some of the benefits that came out of this. Well, one thing is Brian was able to continue his business of investigative journalism. He spent something like three or four months working on a single article about identifying the people who had built this botnet, right? And so he was able to publish that. So they were not able to censor him. Uh, there were some other benefits to us, like we were able to see the, the, um, our rate limiting, uh, which I have a graph of here, was allowing through about twice as much traffic as what we'd configured it to do. No matter where we set the threshold, we were always getting 2x. That was a very interesting bug. It's already been fixed. Uh, and then we were also able to get visibility into the botnet. So for example, we were able to get a, a list of IPs uh, participating in this botnet, which has been useful uh, with Brian's permission. We shared that with law enforcement and we're also able to share it with university researchers. So I, I wanna conclude by saying I was trained as a physicist and you know, in physics, we're always trying to figure out you know, how the world works. But you have to ask the right questions. You have to investigate things. You always have to be willing to question your assumptions. Uh, DDoS defense is very similar. Um, you, know, you can't just look at the attacks you're getting. You have to sort of be more proactive and try to attract more attacks and maybe take some risks. So I'll open this up to questions with one of my own. What risks are you, you willing to take to be sure that you're on top of your field? Thank you.